You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode number 58 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. This week, I'm excited to be sharing a conversation I had with my sponsee, MJ, who has been on past episodes, episode four, which was on the three circles, and episode 18, which we were covering the TV show Lost and how it related to our recovery. So I was excited to have a chance just to talk to him one-on-one about his personal experience, strength, and hope. As I'm recording this, I'm noticing my voice is a a bit messed up and and deeper than than usual. I had the really good fortune for doing an outer circle activity that I absolutely love. Uh, I went to a metal show today and was just yelling and just having a blast. So... As I'm recording this, I can really hear how shouting and and having fun at a concert uh, has affected my voice for recording. So anyway, I thought I would mention that here at the top of this episode. We did this recording a few weeks ago, and so yeah, I won't be sounding like that as I'm talking to my good friend MJ. We did talk about a lot of things, including being a survivor of incest the PTSD that followed that. And uh, in the beginning of the episode, we talked about ogling and staring in the three-second rule. So that prompted me to select a reading from a booklet called Tools of Recovery. And of course, I'll be leaving links to this in the show notes. So on page 19 out of 32 is the three-second rule. This is a tool we use for dealing with visual stimulation or addictive fantasy. As we go through life, we are not in control of what thoughts pop into our minds. However, we make a distinction between that experience and the practice of indulging in addictive fantasy. The three-second rule helps keep us on the right track of that line. Likewise, even with the best intentions, we cross paths with people or images that we could use addictively. That is a part of life. However, obsessively scanning for attractive people on the street, focusing on people's body parts, or staring at stimulating images serves to fuel the addiction. These activities make us vulnerable to more serious behaviors. The way the rule works is that we make an agreement to give ourselves a maximum of three seconds before turning our attention away from triggering images or thoughts. It is not a license to willfully engage in sexual obsession or behavior, even if for only a few seconds. The spirit of this tool is that as soon as we become aware, we turn our behavior over to our higher power and ask for help as quickly as we can. By doing so, we acknowledge our powerlessness and also our freedom to choose the solution. During difficult times, we may use this tool many times throughout the day. Practicing turning away from our addiction and asking for help from our higher power is an important aspect of recovery. We have found that as we stay sober and grow in the program, we experience more and more freedom from the call of our addiction. Just thinking about our discussion when we were talking about the three-second rule, I knew that there was something in our literature that had a really good description of it, and I did find it in Tools of Recovery, so I'm grateful to find that. I also thought about finding a reading on post-traumatic stress disorder because that is a key topic to much of our conversation. I couldn't find anything right away on that. Before getting into the conversation, I did want to mention that I bleeped out a few things here and there in post-production. There were times when MJ mentioned his daughter's name and his wife's name, and he asked me to bleep those out, um, just wanting to keep that information private. 
he also talked about various websites, uh, phone sites. I left the phone site um, unbleeped um, because I think it referred to something years ago, but uh, the website is a chat cam that is current and ongoing, and so I wanted to take the name out of that and leave it kind of general. So if you hear those bleeps in the conversation, that's what it is. The difficult email that I had last week kind of refers to the same type of site. So I don't know if it's exactly the same site, but I just wanted to make sure that I was doing what I can to not bring attention to a specific site. So anyway, uh, with all that, I think I'm ready to turn it over to that conversation. Here it is, and I hope you enjoy it. Everything's great. You know, I almost didn't meditate before this because I was being lazy. Mm -hmm. And then just at the last minute, I did it. And so I'm in a good space and we will let the universe decide. Awesome. That is a fantastic way to go. Yes. Since we've been chatting here, I'll formally start this. Uh, We've got MJ here on the podcast. MJ, you have been on a couple of previous episodes. I know definitely uh, episode 18, where we talked about one of our favorite shows, Lost, and how it related to our recovery. Mm -hmm. And um, it was was another panel one. And was it on the three circles or was it on something different? Do you remember? I think it was three circles and it was very early on. What's amazing about this whole podcast to me is that we work together as you're my sponsor and we work together prior to you starting this. So I remember when we first met and I didn't know you, you're saying, oh, I want to start this podcast. And, you know, people just say stuff all the time. So I said, oh, that'd be great. But now you did it and it's Mm -hmm. going so well and helping people. So it's cool to see. But anyway, I was on very early and then episode 18. And now I'm back. Nice. Yeah. Glad to have you back. The way I usually start this and, you know, because we did the panel discussion before and when we did Lost, both of those were very topic driven rather than having you on as a guest to talk about your experience, strength and hope in the program and you know what your circles are, are like and how you found your way to the rooms of SAA. So I thought we can kind of go over that. And then, you know, maybe after that's all over, kind of catch up with some uh, other life stuff that's going on. Sound good to you? Yes, sir. Awesome. So I don't know if you have your list in front of you, but uh, do you want to share what's in your various circles? Totally. So I think inner circle wise, uh, there's a lot of things that my biggest one was probably phone sex, which I did ever since I was in high school and then internet related chats. So I, I didn't like to be touched, but I still had urges and phone sex was something that I just couldn't get out of my life. And then I would also get into chat rooms, uh, which were kind of similar, Mm -hmm. you know, you would meet people. And then the technology improved to internet chat, you know, and even internet video that, of course, made it more dangerous. But interestingly enough, I always preferred those early analog. Can I talk about a specific company? I'm sure. And if I need to bleep it later, I I will. But go for it. So, yeah, yeah. So Live Links, which was around since I was a kid, was something that I used. I don't know. The last time I used it was probably 2014. Uh, So that's one example of something that was like internet semi-anonymous dating before it even started. You know, I started these behaviors at about 14. And those are my big inner circle. And those are what drove me into the rooms. And then other things would be cheating, of course, including emotional affairs, any kind of like uh, hardcore pornography. As mm-hmm. we would describe it, any type of consumption of porn. Though I have no problem with like R-rated shows. I think we talked about that during Lost. Yeah. So it comes down to intention because I'm trying to become a TV writer, as you know. And so I watch all sorts of shows, and if there's nudity in it, I'm not like, oh, geez, I relent. No, I don't say that in a small way either, dismissively, because I know there are people in the program for whom that's a serious relapse. So I don't mean to dismiss that. I just say for me. I don't count that as a relapse. 
I don't even think it's middle circle. It depends on my reaction to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see. Any of that, of course. I don't know if there's more. So in my inner circle that I can think of. Jason, yeah. Am I missing anything? Not that I can think of. You know, we can get into more specific behaviors uh, a little bit later. There's a couple of things that I wanted to touch upon, but, you know, that will be more uh, towards your story. But um, I think that paints a good picture for your inner circle behaviors. How about uh, middle circle? You already mentioned the nudity on TV shows. Right. Which I'm not even sure if that's in my middle circle. Yeah. You know, it's not it. It's not in your inner circle, is, I think, was right. the, the, the point that you were making. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's not in my outer circle either. It's not like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I want to nourish myself. So let's turn on Game of Thrones. But um, middle circle. So like masturbation is one that would be in there, but it could be outer circle too. It's just in what sense? Mm -hmm. Like right now, my wife's out of the country. So. I don't know if it were becoming compulsive, then I might talk to you because that could lead to something worse. Yeah. So that hasn't been the case. So masturbation is the first one I can think of. And then there would be other things like emotional affairs or something I'm watching out for all the time. Just like, I don't know. I work with a lot of really cool, really brilliant women. And I have friendships with them that I really value and collegial relationships with them that I value, you know, mm -hmm. but I have to make sure that I'm not crossing the line into an emotional affair, especially like if I'm having a fight with my wife and then, you know, I'm messaging someone else on WhatsApp because we do have conversations and stuff all the time. I met with two people today for coffee. Mm -hmm. Now it was, it was for a purpose, but I don't think they know I come here, but they wouldn't mind that. It just has never come up. They know I'm in recovery from drugs, but what I'm saying is, they know my wife is out of town. It wasn't that we met at my house. Everything is above board. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. emotionally cheating in some way. So that's something I have to watch out for because my radar is off a little bit on that. And then voyeurism, I guess voyeurism would be, but just because it bothers me and I know it bothers people who are stared at. So like, yeah, are you talking in terms of ogling or in terms of, you know, things like what, what I've done in terms of window right. peeping and things like that? Well, it's weird that you bring this up. Okay. Cause this came up today. Mm -hmm. Now check this out. And this is going to sound insane, but it's absolutely true as the truth often is my neighbors, as I sit here in my living room, my neighbors across the way, I live in LA. And so there are these apartment complexes are, pushed yeah. on top of each other and the neighbors across the way keep having loud sex mm -hmm. so it's like uh i go there and i shut the window you know and one time they had their blinds open they have their own issues over there so what i'm saying is it's very hot in la you know and today the issue was am i gonna fucking sh can i swear oh yeah 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 cool Am I going to fucking shut this door and be hot because I don't have AC just because they want to have sex? No, it doesn't. Bot they can go ahead and do that. I'll watch TV. They can do it. I don't care. But if I were, say, stimulated by them or if I were watching them the time when they uh, that three second rule when they were over there and they were doing that and the shades were up and I saw that and I was like, oh, my God. I'm not going to get into complaining and calling their landlord or something. I don't give a crap. Anyway, I don't know why I brought that all up. But when I'm talking about voyeurism, I'm talking about oogling, though this yeah. new type of voyeurism, which is almost a passive voyeurism, has shown up at my front door, Jason. I don't know what you want to say about that, but I'm not really a voyeur. And uh, ogling would be more my thing. And I do just to finish up the middle circle. Yeah. It's like a biological reaction. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am on a large college campus all the time and it's hot out and I'm in L.A. So there's opportunities to be like distracted by that. But I use the mantra, oh, sister, may I do you no harm, mm -hmm. which, of course, could be translated to, oh, brother, may I do you no harm. That takes me out of my biological response or my addictive response and into a more spiritual response to a person, you know, and 
that happens. It's amazing how quick that, that switch goes. And it's one of the best things you gave me. You gave me that right away, that mantra. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people um, at the noon meeting have been talking about that and just getting so down on themselves, you know, for noticing, you know, someone that's attractive and it's just like, uh, you know, that is bound to happen. Uh, It is what we do with it, whether we stay in that uh, obsessive state or if we acknowledge it and move on with, with our day. So, you know, we've been talking about the three second rule a lot. When talking about the three second rule, there was kind of the difference of, you know, I am allowing myself to ogle for three seconds versus taking that three seconds, acknowledging and moving on. So from my perspective, the three second rule isn't giving me permission to stare for three seconds. It is giving me an opportunity to acknowledge that I am biologically attracted to whatever I'm looking at, acknowledge it, you know, thank my higher power and, you know, say the, the prayer, sister, may I do you no harm, brother, may I do you no harm, and then move on to my next task. So within, you know, just a couple of seconds, some people have modified it to milliseconds or, or whatever, whatever floats your boat. But yeah, it's not giving us permission to do so. Uh, it's allowing us to not be a perfectionist and get stuck in that. And so having ogling there in the middle circle is, you know, just a a perfect place for it to be. Uh, So you recognize something's going on. If you stay in it, you can probably be drawn back into the inner circle activities, or if you move away from it, you can move on to the outer circle. Yeah. And let me just say, first, I hate the word ogling. It sounds, mm-hmm. it's like moist. It's just, <laughs> yeah. 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 I never would have used that. Uh, so you're just looking at someone, you know, yeah, you're, staring, you're staring. Yeah. Staring. That's better. And three seconds. It's about spiritual intention and it's about not damaging someone by staring at them. Mm-hmm. So like, Oh, okay. I did that. Well, look away. I mean, three seconds is plenty of time, but yeah, it's not a permission to do that for that amount of time. Yeah. And it's so, about, well, th- this is happening. You just explained it well. I don't know mm-hmm. why I'm rehashing. Go no, ahead. No, you know, it was, it was perfect to do that. Um, but yeah, um, when, when I mentioned if, you know, you use that mantra, that prayer and, you know, sister, may I do you no harm, recognize it and then move on. And, you know, those are types of things that pull us away from our inner circle and towards, as I was you know, starting to segue there and in, into our outer circle. So it's going to ask you any, about uh, some of your outer circle activities. Yeah. So that's great. Writing is my big one. Uh, I also bike. So after we're done here today, I'll probably bike to the ocean and back. I love to read novels mostly. I love to watch shows, TV, and movies, but mostly TV. And uh, now, hang out with my daughter. That's a great one. Mm-hmm. She's a she's a baby, and I love hanging out with her. And brand new daddy. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, and they're in Vietnam right now, which is very sad. But they just went there three weeks ahead of me. So anyway, I'll be going there soon for a good chunk of this summer. But I, so I miss them terribly. But that's one. Hanging out with my wife, I really like to hang out with her. We've already reincorporated date nights, so mm-hmm. of course part of it. And that brings up another interesting thing, like I try to do. Mm-hmm. She doesn't even know what I'm saying yet, but she's already getting it. So I put my hands, the people at home can't see my hands, but I frame my hands like I'm about to pick her up under mm-hmm. her shoulders. And then I say, may I pick you up? And she's just a baby, but now she's starting to get it. Like she'll move her hands like, yeah, I want you to pick me up. So nice. anyway, yeah, I try to incorporate that consent into her thought process right away. Like people just can't come up and touch her. When yeah, was that's baby, great. Yeah. And that's been a big part of my addiction, you know, because I didn't, I never liked people touching me. And I remember one time this great aunt, it's like a famous story in our family came up and tried to kiss me and she did. And I freaking kicked her. And this predates my abuser. The, the mm-hmm. abuse. I kicked her as hard as I could in the calf. And she was like, ah. And, you know, I think back on that. Well, she was breaking my boundaries. And I reacted in the only way I could as a little kid. So 
I'm not saying I'm right for that violent response. I'm just saying, kids, we don't have a right to do stuff to them they don't want just because they're little. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. to me, that includes picking them up. So anyway, that's just something I've been thinking about. Uh, So those are my outer circle behaviors. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Coming to meetings, of course. Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. A little bit later, I wanted to touch on, you know, fatherhood, wanted to touch on writing and what you're doing with that. But, you know, we'll move that out towards the end. And I wanted to delve into, and it is strictly at your comfort level, what you feel comfortable sharing here on the podcast about your childhood growing up, things that happened and how you got into recovery to begin with, and then the rooms of SAA afterwards. So kind of taking that storyline, if you will. Yes. I don't feel like dwelling tonight. I do want to be honest and forthright because it's important. I feel a responsibility as a man and as a person to normalize this discussion and make sure, you know, it would be cool if in 20 years, sex addiction were as normalized as drug addiction is now uh, recovery from sex addiction. And and I will say too, when it's come up with friends and colleagues, they do seem to have a different and kind of positive take on it. So I hope that started. But anyway, Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just start when I was a kid. I was kind of friendless. I was really a weird kid. And I was raised by a, a single mom my last name belongs to a man who raised me, but was not my biological father, but he was the biological father of my two half brothers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was kind of the weird one. At least I felt that way. I don't know that they would say it that way, but that's how I felt. And when I was a teenager, we moved out to the country. My mom was in psych ward several times in my youth. Anyway, There's a history now I know of sexual abuse on her side of the family that goes back, at least as I've been able to track two generations, and I'm sure it goes before that, but I was sexually abused by her, by my mom, and um, it was strange because though I was physically abused, now I see like how it was physical and psychological, and it's so strange and insidious to think about grooming now. Because there were so many things like moving out to the country where I didn't have anywhere to go. It was as soon as I hit puberty is when it started. There were just a lot of things that I don't know how intentional it all was, but it could have been. But anyway, the, the real result was that I was sexually abused by her. And that made it really hard because it threw my radar off of what was sexually appropriate right away. Mm-hmm. It also caused me to turn down a lot of opportunities with, not a lot, but it it caused me to start to turn down any opportunities for a normal relationship, quote unquote, with someone my age. And that's kind of a theme that ran right up into my 30s. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it morphed, but it was the same idea of running from a relationship. But as a teen... I was like allergic to people touching me because my first quote unquote sexual experience was, you know, laying in a bed naked with my mom. I mean, of course, saying it out loud now, that's going to throw you off. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, and my mom's inspecting my genital area. Like that's going to throw you off as a kid. And it threw me off. Now you and I have talked about this and I want to make sure that this is balanced in two ways Mm -hmm. as I talk about it publicly. Number one, that I acknowledge the abuse. And number two, that I don't use it as an excuse for things I did wrong. So those Mm -hmm. two things, like as a sex addict, you know, I emotionally hurt a lot of people. There was the trial today, the Johnny Depp trial. And I was thinking Mm -hmm. how many, because Kate Moss came back and testified for him. And I thought, how many of my exes would come back and testify for me? And then I was like, well, shit, not many, (laughs) you know, because it's, What I'm saying is I was a difficult person to be with because I was totally emotionally disconnected. Mm -hmm. Now, did some of that emotional disconnection come from the abuse? Yes. What I've heard 
And what I really like, and I think the reason I really took to this right away is because to get positive with it, I'm not responsible for my disease, but I am responsible for my recovery. Mm. And I think one of the, one of the reasons I keep working this program so hard is regardless of what I was responsible, who harmed me or who I harmed all that shit. I, today I'm not doing any of that today. I'm raising a kid in a home where hopefully she's happy, where it's peaceful. You know, I have my own mental health issues. I'm medicated. And my number one goal in life is that she doesn't have to deal with that heft, that that cycle is stopped. So that being said, it gets tricky because I'm disclosing vaguely. So let's talk about what some of the things I did wrong in my teenage years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So I know that there was a lot of drinking. I'm also at that same time I was using drugs and drinking heavily, you know. To my knowledge, I didn't physically sexually abuse anyone. In fact, I, I can say pretty surely that I didn't. I did later on expose myself on like and stuff. And though you're supposed to be 18, I'm sure that not everyone was. So that's definitely uh, something that I have to live with because that's a type of abuse, certainly. What else did I do wrong? I was emotionally unavailable. I got my first serious girlfriend pregnant when I was 18. And when I say serious, see, I was emotionally disconnected and it's hard to be with someone for long. So we'd been together about two months and then I relapsed because I was sober for two months at 18 and they, I relapsed and the night before the abortion and I fucking spilled all this stuff to her, you know, I spilled all this stuff to her and, uh, put a lot of weight on her shoulders we were both 18. So it's complicated. Like thinking back now, I was a fucking kid. Mm -hmm, Her mom, mm -hmm. And so I carried weight about that too. And her mom told me not to tell any of my, which I wasn't close to my family anyway, for obvious reasons. So it was a complicated situation, but I tried to be there for her, but I wasn't. And then after that, I was just emotionally shitty. And then we tried to keep the relationship going. She went to Duluth and I went to Minneapolis. Of course I, cheated i was working at a bagel shop and i probably messed around with every single person i worked with in that bagel shop it was just a fucking orgy when i think back on that it was just a drug and alcohol infused orgy that bagel shop was and that's not good either because i was the supervisor Uh, i don't mean to make that grandiose i was the supervisor and so that's i'm sure wrong though we were all contemporaries age-wise anyway From August to November, we'd broken up. So thinking back, I remember there was actually two women that really liked me that worked at that bagel shop. And one of them I slept with and then didn't really talk to her after that. And that was kind of a pattern with me. Like any kind of intimacy was the last time you were going to talk to me. It's Mm -hmm. hard because I'm trying not to make this sound grandiose. It's hard for me to tell the truth about this time in my life, though I'm certainly trying to, because I don't want to sound bigger than I am, like puff myself up. Yeah, yeah. Because by the end, it was really sad. But there were two women at this bagel shop, and we would all hang out together and get drunk together. And there was another one, and I really liked her. And it would have been fine for me to start dating her. But then we messed around, and then I started saying mean things about her to everyone. And that was kind of a, that kind of pushing away by any means necessary was something I did a lot. But anyway, then I joined the Marines because I was having a hard time making rent and my disease really ramped up. I worked for a church for a couple of years Mm -hmm. during the Sandusky era. And I really wanted everything. I just kept repeating. I want to be appropriate. I want to be appropriate. And I did. I wanted everything to be okay for those kids, you know? I didn't want anything bad to happen to those kids and not by my hand. I wasn't worried about that, nor did I even think that I was a sex addict at that time, but I mean, by anyone's hand. So I tried to make sure that there were always like two, three people in the room and do best practices. And I didn't even date during the two years or whatever that I worked there because I really wanted everything to be appropriate. But then immediately upon quitting that job, I went on another kind of spree and it's the biggest spree i ever went on i moved to minneapolis that was in mankato so i moved to the city and got a job working with handicapped people and 
that's when I was doing live links. Uh, so meeting up with people from the phone. I got a smartphone, so I was online dating on several things. Not only was I doing phone sex, and I was also paying for phone sex and using the chat rooms. I would call this one specific chat room that was free. And it got really deep on that chat room. Like there's one person I would speak to repeatedly about something called total life exchange. And I don't know exactly what that is, but it creeped me out. I got pretty far into that where they were talking about moving to my house or my apartment at that time and like living in a box. Whoa. And they did that. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. That's what total life exchange is. And they, they'd done that before. And there were almost sadistic impulses that I did have where I don't think I wanted to hurt anyone, but I certainly didn't have a lot of empathy. And so anonymous or semi-anonymous encounters, though I was nice to people during the encounters were all I could really do. And I was unsafe a lot. And during that time, as I said, I was also on video chat apps a lot because those things are really tricky. So as I said earlier, I'm not sure I definitely expose myself during chats on there. You're supposed to be 18, but as you know, anybody can click that fucking button and say they're 18. And I also consciously knew that at that time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the most that I abused. I think there were also times, see, it gets into like role play too, because there were people who would say stuff that, was it really true? Like, I don't know. It's hard. And so anyway, that went on for a couple of years. And then it started to get really sad because by that time, there was this really nice girl that I'd gone to school with. She wrote reviews and she wrote, she was in a class of mine and she wrote a review about a Bill Murray film. And anyway, we started mm -hmm. dating. She was very nice. And I was totally emotionally unavailable and I couldn't explain why and all this stuff was weighing on my head and she said to me and I just kind of I feel tortured her and she was a writer too and really nice person and of course we weren't meant to be together I was in a couple of years going to meet my wife and get into recovery but I remember something she said and it kind of haunts me and she said you know you don't treat me badly except when you think you do you retreat hmm I think that goes for a lot of my relationships. I would just leave in order to not hurt someone. Not physically. That's not what I'm talking about. But uh, Emotionally? Emotionally. Any kind of emotional connection scared me to death. And so once I left Minneapolis, I moved to some rural. I was kind of rural in Ohio. And then I moved to L.A. the first time. And during that time is when my addiction took a sad downturn. I was still, especially in LA, you can find semi-anonymous partners. You know, it's hard because the prostitution thing. Yes, I got prostitute. I called my first prostitute when I was 16. I mean, I don't mind saying out of the fucking phone book. See, I'm analog. But what I'm saying is in this kind of world, the sad, the hookup area of online dating, prostitution becomes kind of a gray area. I don't know if you can relate to this where it's kind of like people who need their electric bill paid sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's like that. And it's sad. It was just so sad. And, but I participated in it and quite a bit. And this is a small side issue, but I was also, and I have always been very cheap. And so I would try, and what bothered me too is the way I would be very cheap. You know, you're negotiating with people. It's, it's just, so anyway, mm -hmm. I did that, but I also would um, call these lines a lot. And by this time, that part of my life, it was always when I was out of control. I started calling phone sex lines immediately, almost after I was abused. I can see now a few things happened right after I was abused, right after the abuse started. I started calling phone sex lines and I called hundreds of dollars worth at our house. And it was almost like I was saying, fuck you, you know, to my. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I did that and I 
started using drugs whenever I could and drinking whenever I could. I loved drugs and drinking. I got clean from that when I was 22. I'm 41 now, and I didn't get sober in SAA until, I don't know, now it's coming up on two years ago. So Yeah, yeah. But phone sex thing would continually pop up, and it's what brought me in here. And the chat room with a total life exchange person. I can still remember that area. I can still remember that number. I wish I could re- remove it from my brain. Mm-hmm. It's a free number you can call, and there are these chat rooms, and they are rough places to be. It's a very lonely place to be. But anyway, I would call these and sit on them for hours. And I would call after a long time. Again, phone sex can become kind of a thing, just like I described, where it's still prostitution. You're paying someone, but they want to be there too. And maybe it's just, you know, one dollar to go into some certain room, et cetera. But it would happen for just hours upon hours. And it was a reaction to any time I felt out of control. And Mm. that's part of, I had a feeling at that time. And hopefully if someone hears this, they're getting that. Tonight, I feel like I'm halting. There's a weird thing too. When you get close to the truth, you feel like you're halting, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's like, you can't really say it, but I'm trying to be as forthright as I can. I almost felt like my actual physical chest was ripped open, like it happens in horror movies. Sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. My heart was exposed. That's how I felt when I would be emotionally exposed in a relationship, when I would be vulnerable to someone. Yeah. That's how it felt. And I avoided that at all costs. And... um so I still had quote unquote needs, I guess. And that's why I would do all these different phone sex and chat room things. And by the time I got to you, see, I met my wife and that started to turn it around because I met my wife and then the Marines sent me a letter because I had left the Marines. I, I was always doing just things that didn't make sense. And I didn't realize that I had PTSD mm-hmm. uh, from when I was a kid. And this predates my abuse. Some other things happened around, like at one time, my mom was walking through the house with a knife saying she was going to kill herself and she'd taken a bunch of pills. And oh, wow. Was, yeah, it was kind of crazy. And I took my brothers and hid in this closet under a bunch of clothes. That's one example that and then it, an ambulance came and took her and she was in the psych ward for a while. And Like we would have fucking birthdays in the psych ward. I've spent time in the psych ward. And then later on in my life, she thought I was Jesus. Uh, she had wow. this whole psychosis thing worked out yeah and that fucks you up you know i'm already weird and anyway so you got the thing from the marines with the the ptsd thank you yeah thank you i found out that i had ptsd and at that time all i could do for work was drive around and do uber because i would get too angry i was just angry all the time my life was slipping away from me and i could feel it happening then actually she was probably my fiance at that time yeah I had met her and I had uh, I had met her and I saw that I could live differently like I knew that I could but I didn't know how to and then the universe like started coming the universe that old thing like the Malcolm X autobiography if you take one step toward Allah Allah will take two steps toward you mm-hmm. and I'm not Muslim I actually practice in Buddhism not that it matters what I practice but I love that saying and that entire book, that's kind of a book about recovery. But anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, RIP Malcolm X. What happened was I got this letter saying that people with my type of discharge, they found had a lot of mental health problems. Well, duh. Mm-hmm. I had a, a medical discharge, basically, because uh, I went into a halfway house and got clean for drugs. So they found that people with these types of medical general discharges, which is kind of in the middle, had psychological problems later. Big surprise. Mm-hmm. So they were offering us free therapy. This was the beginning of the sun finally coming out. So I was about 36 then. I was driving Uber. I was with my wife, but I still would call these phone sex lines. What's crazy about it is I would tell my wife about it. You know, I was always very open with her and I didn't know how to stop it. And it would only happen then when I was really, when something was really stressful, really sad, but it kept happening. Anyway, I went into treatment 
the lady said June was her name and God, she was awesome. She changed my life. She said, after she looked at all the tests and everything, the VA actually told me, we can't help you. You weren't, you were kicked out too soon. And I was like, well, why are you fucking sending people letters? And I'm holding this letter up in the VA lobby <laughs> and screaming, <laughs> you shouldn't be sending people with psych discharges letters <laughs> saying you'll help them. And they said, well, we got something for you. And they sent me to something called a vet center where they're a little more open in who they'll help. And June, I went to her and she said, I'm not supposed to help you, but I also have this thing I can do where I can help certain people kind of under the radar. And so June really changed my life. And I appreciate so much that she did that. She was this old Kentuckian. Anyway, I took this test for her and after our, I don't know, a very brief number of sessions in this test she had, she said, you got PTSD. And I said, what? I never went to battle. And then she explained to me how I got it when I was a kid and from my abuse. And I had, and then she's like, what are your symptoms? Because I would explain at that time, I still would go visit my mom. And I still didn't know that I'd been abused. That's how insidious it is. And this, mm -hmm. I, I hear this from people a lot now, like they get in their 30s. And that's when people kind of know, because you just think it's normal. Like I thought a lot of this stuff was normal, which sounds crazy now, but that's how. So I would leave my mom's house. I wouldn't be able to breathe for hours and my arms would be flexed, literally. They would be flexed like this. And I would leave her house and it was horrible. And basically what was happening over and over again is I was going to hang out with my abuser and then having a PTSD reaction. And she would still say and do things that would activate like i still remember the last time i went to her house i didn't like her to hug me but she came up and hugged me and then she rubbed her hand on my shoulders and chest while i backed away and she said oh look at your chest have you been doing push-ups oh god i hear it now and i just want to puke but i told this story to june and she said you're going to visit your abuser and getting thrown into PTSD symptoms every single time. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. And I also was, it's weird because I was engaged. I didn't have much money at all. And in the midst of that, I gave my mom a $6,000 car that I had. I just gave it to her, signed it over to her. And like, I could have sold it. I had offers, but I gave it to her because she said she needed one. Stuff like that. Like my wife went to Vietnam for the summer and I couldn't go because I'd given my mom this car. So I'm trying to start my life and I knew something was wrong with my relationship. I didn't know nearly how deep it went, but I knew I couldn't stand to be around her, that I couldn't breathe. And I would do things that she wanted that I didn't want to do. And I yeah. knew that was wrong. But anyway, so this car was like the last thing. And and June says, you know, have you considered not talking to her? And, and I tried it. And then what's weird, I'd never blocked anyone before I blocked her. And I felt this relief and it continued. And then my phone, while I was in therapy, I switched phones and I forgot to reblock her. This was six months later. And mm -hmm. it was she was unblocked for like a day. And during that time, I got one of those 18 page long, crazy ass text messages from her. Uh, which you'd write to like an X. And yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And I, I don't know if I said this before, but I want to say that I know now that the reason I couldn't date or for more than two months with anyone is I was for all intents and purposes in a relationship with my mom. Mm -hmm. This kind of creeped me out, but it's, it's actually true. I was in an incestuous relationship. And so uh, breaking out of that has been kind of what recovery has been for me. But anyway, June sent me, she said, do you want to go to this program that this general is doing for people who have suffered sexual abuse and have PTSD? She's like, it's very specific. They're only having like eight people to this retreat. You go to Maryland. And I came home and asked, her, and she's like, go, go. And so I went and I went to Maryland and it was life changing. I met seven other men who this had happened to and who had PTSD as a result of it. And we all understood each other so deeply. It was like a meeting, but exponential because we understood each other so much, Jason. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
and it was so fucking painful. All of us were in so much pain and our pain was so deeply related. And that was like an uprooting of so much pain that week. And then I came home and I found you and SAA shortly thereafter. And yeah. from literally from the first time I went to the noon meeting, you know, the first time I went to the virtual meeting, I've been clean because I, I don't know, it all came together very quickly. I knew right away what the solution was. I'd had that experience in Maryland of people who are like me. I heard the same thing at the meetings. Of course, I had a lot of 12 step history. It was just almost a feeling like I should have been here 15 years ago. And so I've been sober now for 21 or 22 months. In August, it'll be two years. And mm -hmm. so they've been the best two years of my life. And not only I have noticed there have been more people from my immediate family that I've stopped talking to who are kind of wrapped up in that sickness and the relationships with the people that are my family have improved greatly and I continue to try to improve them anyway that's been my journey I have as you know work six steps with you now so I'm yeah. halfway halfway done with the first round in SAA and we've kind of taken our time but I I think that's been good though I drug my feet on the fourth step a little bit because I've been able to see yeah it. yeah a lot of yeah. sponsees do <laughs> yeah but I did yeah. we did do it and that yeah. was cool and the thing I'm most happy about is my daughter won't have to grow up. Listen, I may not become a success as a writer, but my daughter will not have to grow up in that cycle of abuse. Yeah. I'm going to fucking make sure of it. And that makes me, when I say that to you, though, I have divulged horrible things that I've done. Uh, when I say that to you, it makes me feel so happy about my life. And I'll tell you what else. I don't have any bad feelings toward my mom at all. I cannot talk to her for obvious reasons. I need to maintain a distance, but I don't have any anger toward her because I know now that she was abused by my grandfather. And I know that. And I know what happened. And I know that my grandfather was abused by his mother. My yeah. grand, I've, I've done some detective work and figured. And, and so I'm sure that it goes back in a, in a line from there. Who knows where it started, but. It's stopping here. Now, yeah. that particular strand, and it almost feels like life's work in some ways. Like, I can still be kind of an asshole. Again, I'm, I'm probably... Character defects coming up. <laughs> yeah, character defects can come up. And I, I still can alienate people. I know that. Um, I still have a tendency to try to push people away. But I'm also, because of that, very loyal in a lot of ways, like people who stick with me, I don't know how you feel about it, but like, I'm very loyal and very appreciative on the flip side of that. So that's kind of my yeah. journey. And that's what's been going on with me and how I got here. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing all that. There were you know some definite things that I, I wanted to touch upon. But yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you. You were just on a on a flow there. When we first started working together, and I think I had mentioned this probably on the, the podcast we did on Lost, that you know, we connected instantly over, you know, a lot of music and a lot of TV shows and movies and stuff. So we had that right off the bat. But as I started working with you and, and we started talking about the PTSD, my wife suffers from PTSD as a lot of partners who go through discovery that mm -hmm. is a traumatic event. And then there have been several other events in her life and, and that, you know, I'm not going to go into here, but there are other abusers in, in her life besides the uh, betrayal trauma that I've caused. And so understanding her PTSD over the past five years, I've been getting a lot better with understanding symptoms, understanding uh, triggers and um, lots of different aspects of it. And so like when you started talking about some of the things that were going on with you, um, there was one phone call where we had that you were just triggered as fuck and you, you couldn't narrow it down. And I'm just like, oh, my wife gets the same exact thing. And, you know, we started comparing notes and it was definitely the, the PTSD. So you've helped 
you've helped me understand PTSD more by, by working with you and that ends up uh, helping my relationship with my wife. So um, early on in, in recovery, I know she was in the thick of it and I had no fucking clue on, you know, what was going on with her and why she acted the way she did. And, and there, there are plenty of instances where there are much better choices of ways that I could have reacted to uh, different events in my life. And so having that knowledge now has helped me in my relationship with her. And it, so when there's the sponsor sponsee relationship, you know, the sponsors passing on, you know, institutional knowledge about the steps, but we're also getting that, that knowledge back. So, you know, I definitely uh, appreciate that, you know, everything that, that you've shared with me in, in this uh, sponsor sponsee relationship. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And What's interesting, though, is with PTSD, you're so everything goes along fine. It's not it doesn't at least this is my experience with it, but it sounds like it's communal with your wife. Everything's going along fine. And then a trigger comes up. They call it arousal, but I don't obviously like that for obvious reasons. So, yeah, yeah. I, I call it like act, activate or triggered and the brain just explodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it goes everywhere to bring the old horror movie analogy. It just your brain goes and it goes yeah, everywhere. Yeah, scanners. <laughs> yeah, right. And and uh, and it doesn't come back together for a while, like a while, because it sucks out all your energy, all your dopamine and serotonin. And then you get depressed because mm-hmm. you know, all this fucking energy and happiness is just gone. It's just it's like it's sucked out with a straw by the episode. So. I felt right from the first time I talked to you that you got that. And it's really nice to not have to explain it. It's yeah. Probably the, the unspoken foundation of our relationship. So that's cool. It helps me. You've helped me a lot too, because of that. So it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so uh, a couple of the other things I wanted to touch upon was with your writing. So we talked about this um, in the last episode that you were uh, going to school to do writing for script writing for TV shows and stuff. And you've been actively working on that and wanted to see how, you, how all that was going with you. Um, which part exactly? Cause I could talk. <laughs> w- w- yeah. How the program at your school is going and, if you care to talk about that, you know, it's an outer circle thing. Um, totally. Yeah. So I got nominated for these two awards for, I want to be a television writer and I was nominated for an hour long script. So it's like the drama, the lost script. It's easy. Drama is a loose term. Like, I don't know if lost is a drama or is it a sci-fi, et cetera. Yeah. But as you know, more than the genre TV shows are categorized by time now. So there's basically the cluster of hour longs and cluster of half hour longs. And I have a script that was nominated in each of those categories for this big award that's coming up, like a gala. I think I'm going to go buy a bow tie. So that's pretty cool. It's all ending soon. It's kind of a third step issue because it's ending and it's really hard to break in. And I hope I can. It seems like about 10 to 20 percent of people from my program do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then maybe another 10 to 20% end up in adjacent areas. You know, there's no guarantee, but I'm really glad I went there because it was a dream I always had. Actually, when I was in Maryland, the last night that I was in Maryland, you're supposed to talk to yourself in five years. And I wanted to chase this dream. And that's what I yelled to myself on the chair. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that, that was in Maryland. And there's this really cool general who started this whole Maryland program. Operation Tahidu, it's called. And Tahidu is a word that means peace of mind, body, and spirit. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah. And so he started it and he started it based on PTSD, but then it also went into sexual abuse because they started to specify different weeks. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yep. So he ran this and he and I really hit it off. And he liked spy shows, obviously, being a former general, but he had increased and expanded the understanding of PTSD tremendously within the military. And now it was his job after the military. And he had it himself 
uh, due to a bombing he was in. And that guy, he's one of the most amazing people I've ever met. We liked each other. I mean, we got along even more than beyond the program. We would sit and talk. And anyway, this is what I wanted to do. And it's interesting because I was always bothered by my discharge. Mm -hmm. And then that night, the general said to me, you are honorable because I didn't have an honorable discharge. And he said, you are honorable. And it, it really meant something to me. And it was a weight that was lifted that I think allowed me, I think things that had happened in my addiction that I'd done had lowered my self-esteem. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this in such a way that I wasn't willing to lift that rock off myself, even though I wanted to by the end. It wasn't like this was some fun, magical thing by the end. It was just mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. And all I wanted was to stop and I couldn't. And him saying that that night, and it was such a cathartic night. And then going to do it, coming out here and doing this, chasing my dream, going to one of the coolest film schools in the world, you know, being taught by Oscar and Emmy winners. And it's been such a cool experience that yes i want to be successful afterward but i can't control that at all i really hope i don't have to go back to teaching but if i do i do and i accept that you know it goes back to my daughter because i want her to know that you can chase your dream and yeah so anyway i work on it every day in some form or fashion i write every single day and if anyone is an artist out there, they'll understand that art is, it's not about inspiration. I'm not going to say it's about perspiration, that <laughs> I was led to it. But it's interesting because I was a wrestler in high school and even two years of college, I wrestled and uh, I wasn't good. So let me just say it as an NCAA Division II heavyweight, I was one and 11. <laughs> <laughs> and that means one win, 11 losses. And the person I beat was at an open tournament. They weren't even a college wrestler. They just came off the couch and wanted to relive the glory days. And I did beat them. But every <laughs> actual college wrestler beat me. So anyway, I said that to say I wasn't good, but I kept doing that for years and years. And I really only had one successful season my senior year of high school that allowed me to go off and try to do it in college. And so I, I kept going at it for years and just got beat up. I got beat to shreds. I'm sure it didn't help the PTSD. And I think about like that, my brain, I bet I have some of that NFL like granular stuff happening in my brain because I got a lot of concussions. But anyway, I said all that to say, what I learned from that is daily work. And I do bring that into my artistic life. I don't even think of it artistically. It's just like something I do and I do enjoy doing it. So I don't mind that. But Every day, you just got to do it, do it, do it, do it. And I think the key is to find something you like doing so you can keep doing it like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And yeah, lastly, I wanted to, just to say, you know, just how cool it is, you know, watching you become a father in, in this program and, and how, you know, seeing the changes in you and, yeah, I remember like right when you when you guys were going through it with the pregnancy and 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 everything, and that you were away from our noon meetings for a while for for a good reason, and mm -hmm. you know when you've you know come back and you know been on you know it's like in the middle of a share. Wait, I've got to go take care of her and, and stuff, yeah. and just the understanding and love that you know, the room has. We've got to. A couple of guys that are in that meeting that have some relatively young, you know, newborns to uh, toddlers that, you know, you can hear in the background at, at lunchtime <laughs> and stuff. And just, it's just so awesome to, to see, you know, us as parents in recovery and trying to break that cycle and, you know, be able to you know, talk to our kids in the way that our, our parents weren't able to. I know that, you know, I've done that with my son and I can't guarantee how his life will go, 
but you know, just trying to be open and honest um, with sexuality and recovery and trying to pass on some of the the program tools and things that I've learned. You know, sometimes it's directly and sometimes it's kind of indirectly, or I'll have him do a quote unquote fourth step by just you know asking him a couple questions. You know, it's not I, I'm not making him you know sit down and write out anything, but you know, it's just like um, you know, what's bothering you? What did that person do? Did you do anything to to cause anything in this situation? And right, just, just like to have him to to you know think about these these types of things. So when you talk to you know about having your daughter and just wanting to to break that cycle and and to bring a, a peaceful household, you know that's you know such an amazing gift of of the program. Well, thank you. Yeah, it is a gift. And I will say, and I didn't realize I was doing this, and my wife may say it's not enough, but I'm very involved. Like, until now, they're out. Every night, I hang out with her until about 2 in the morning, you know, so my wife can get some sleep separate from her, and I hang out with her, and and 2 or 3, and I watch TV shows if she's sleeping, get some Mm -hmm. of my homework done or whatever, but I sit out here with her, and we hang out, I talk to her, and... I change a lot of diapers. I do all the stuff and I really like doing it. It's been really cool. I like fatherhood and it is a really cool gift. Brilliant. Unless you have anything else, I think this is a good way to wrap up. There's like a whole whole bunch of TV shows that I wanted to talk about and, and uh, how you know, I'm seeing how they they relate to recovery, but you know, that can be for another episode. One of them that I, you know, I've mentioned on and off has been Russian doll. <laughs> I, oh, we got to talk about Russian doll. Jay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think uh, that will be an episode uh, to itself. But yeah, I was planning on talking about season one, which is yes. just, you know, definitely about recovery. Season two took off in a different direction, but I see um, generational trauma. <laughs> as mm. kind of the theme for that. So, you know, I'd love to have you on again and we can either discuss that show in particular, or maybe a couple of, couple of shows that we see how they relate to recovery, but you, you being the, the TV script writer and you know, you're my guy to go to for talking about lost. Um, you know, I think it would be brilliant. So I'd love to have you on Did again. You, I will anytime. Yeah. The reason I don't ask is because you, I'm sure, get lots of requests, but I'm always here. All you have to do is say, hey, and I'm here. Yeah, and that, that was one of the brilliant things. The way this landed, uh, there was uh, an interview that I had hopefully was going to set up for this week. Uh, it got pushed till next week, and another interview got pushed till next week. So t- next week, I'm doing two. Um, so I had nothing lined up for this week, and you were telling me that, uh, you were taking your wife and daughter to the airport and they were going out to Vietnam and that you'll be joining them in a couple of weeks and wanted to do some some more check-ins. I'm just like, dude, let's do a check-in on the podcast. So <laughs> let's this, do it. Yeah, it worked out perfectly. So I'm really, really grateful for you joining me here tonight. I'm grateful for you. So yeah, I you know, like I like I said, I am so grateful that it worked out. And, you know, no doubt I'll see you on one of the noon meetings you know, probably this week. So, you know, grateful you, for you showing up here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm grateful for you, my friend. <laughs> All right. Peace. Peace. Uh, many thanks to MJ. Yeah, I definitely do plan to have him back where we can talk about different TV shows that cover addiction or recovery. After recording this conversation with MJ, he had some more really good news about his writing career, which is really awesome that he is getting in contact with several agents after they heard about his nomination for the two awards that he talked about. Wanted to give kind of an update on that. Thinking of updates, uh, I did receive an email this week 
a new listener listening to some various episodes and heard the first episode, I think, with LJ, not to be confused with MJ. So LJ has a book out and links to what he's used for guiding sponsees through their step work. And so this person reached out to me and asked if I could provide him with that information. And I was happy to do that. I don't readily put that here on the recording of the podcast due to uh, the traditions and just not wanting to break anonymity. But if people are interested in his book or his uh, step work, you can always drop me a line and I will be happy to get that to you. Uh, just in news, I think he may have mentioned it on one of the episodes. So he was on episode five early on, I think roughly around uh, episode 17 and another one on the ninth step promises. Recently, he's been talking about his mental health. Um, he's got a brain degenerative disease that is making it hard for him to remember conversations and stuff. And so we just got news about that at our noon meetings. And I was hoping to have him here again on the podcast sometime soon, but just knowing that he's having uh, difficulties, I'm not sure what the best route for that is. But I am forever grateful for getting to know him over the past few years and just the amount of help that he's had with other people in our program through sponsoring and, and answering phone calls and just being of general service in our meetings. It's been a tremendous, tremendous gift. That kind of catches up on the emails that we've been getting. I did also want to mention that we have been getting some comments on the YouTube channel, and I'm not going to read those here on this episode, but I may read some on a future episode. Uh, before closing out this episode, I did want to mention that the metal show that I went to, it's kind of fun, was right next to the hotel where we had the 2018 SAA International Convention in Oakland. It was in the parking lot right next to the hotel, and so while well, being at the show, it was fun uh, looking over at the hotel and just remembering what a fun time that convention was. I'm recording the rest of this outro a day later, so my voice is healing a little bit. But yeah, still basking in the afterglow of that fun, fun show. I mentioned in the beginning that I wanted to read some information about PTSD, and could not find much in our SAA literature. I did find a couple of articles that I'm going to leave links for in the show notes, and these are outside the realm of our program, and so it's just information about the effects of PTSD from childhood sexual trauma. And so for anyone that was wanting to learn a little bit more about that, I thought it would be nice to leave those links. So with all that being said, if you wish to reach us and leave some feedback for the podcast, you can reach us at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. If you wish to reach me personally, you can reach me at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. So that will wrap up this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA. 